Welcome. Let me invite you into our conversation today. I'm Carrie White, your Zoom host for this afternoon for Making Young Voters, Promoting Youth Engagement in American Democracy. Yesterday, we had a wonderful conversation with our 2021 Julie and J. Rothbaum Distinguished Lecturer, Sunshine Hillegas. Um, Professor Hillegas um, not only provided one of her lectures for us yesterday, but some great conversation um, and Q&A. And today we get to engage in more conversation with a panel. So I do want to invite you to engage with us today. Um, not only can you use the chat box to have conversation with the panelists, authors, and other participants, um, but we would invite you to engage with us on social media. You see the Facebook and Twitter handles there. Please feel free to, to join along. I want to just remind you, I know most of us are so experienced with Zoom by now that this is probably unnecessary, but you can take control of your own viewing options. We'll be using the spotlight feature today so that you can focus in on the panelists, but you will also have the freedom to make changes using the view or view options buttons at the top of your screen. As I mentioned, we'll be using the uh, chat box today for just regular conversation, but also for our Q&A with the panelists. If you have a question specifically that you would like to be raised to the panel, if you would start that question with the word question in all caps, that will help our moderator see it and draw attention to it and know that you're not just throwing that out for everyone to chat with. If it is for one of our specific panelists, if you would indicate that too, if it's specifically for one person over the whole panel. If you need any technical help, please feel free to use the chat box to chat with me, Carrie White, your host for today's event. On your Zoom tools, you do have the option for closed captioning. So if you would like a live auto transcription of the discussion, you can turn those subtitles on. We are recording today's event. So we would love to see your faces. The panelists would love to know who they're talking to, but we understand if you uh, do not want your image recorded, then please um, don't, uh, feel free to, to turn your camera off. Um, but that recording does mean that you will be able to access the recording later on uh, the YouTube channel. And finally, it is the expectation of the University of Oklahoma and all of our partners that everyone feel welcomed, included, and have a sense of belonging in today's conversation. So we ask you to keep that in mind as you make comments. So again, thank you for engaging with us today. And with that, I am gonna turn things over to Mike to kick us off. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to day two of the what we're calling the 2021 uh, Julian J. Rothbaum Distinguished Lecture Series on Representative Government. Uh, my name is Michael Crespin. I'm the director and curator of the Carl Albert Congressional Research and Studies Center. Uh, the center is proud to host its 20th Rothbaum Lecture, reflecting our core mission to strengthen representative democracy through engaged and informed citizens. Uh, this lecture, endowed by Joel Jankowski and his mother, Irene Rothbaum, serves to promote ideals that Julian Rothbaum held dear in his own life and that the Carl Albert Center seeks to achieve in all its efforts. Mr. Rothbaum believed most strongly that the lectureship should underscore the importance of education, which enhances the quality of participation in public affairs, the cultivation of public service and future political leaders, and the broad-based engagement of private citizens in public affairs. Our theme this year, Making Young Voters, I think fits this description perfectly. Uh, yesterday, we watched a lecture and had a great conversation with our speaker, uh, Professor Sunshine Hillegas from Duke University. We talked about the important problems of youth voter turnout, as well as potential solutions. Uh, today, Dr. Hillegas is joined by a panel of experts and practitioners uh, who work in the trenches trying to get more young people involved in civic affairs. Um, our panelists will talk about what they do as well as how strategies might change in light of uh, what we learned yesterday from Dr. Hillegas. Today's conversation, yesterday's events, and Dr. Hillegas' longer lectures uh, that she's recorded will be available on our YouTube channel, and that's uh, the link there is put in the chat. Our panel today is led by our own Lauren Schuler, 
Uh, Lauren is the director of the Carl Albert Center's National Education for Women's Leadership Program and also leads and coordinates the civic engagement programs at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, I should say Lauren also practices what she preaches uh, as she was just elected to the Norman City Council. I will now turn the show over to Lauren who will introduce our co-panelists and start us off with a few questions. Lauren. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, happy to be here with everyone. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to have this conversation um, kind of taking us from the, the research um, that Professor Hillegas has done um, and has kind of provided us this groundwork, um, but also realizing that there are many people um, in, in the work that are doing this on the ground, um, on university campuses, through nonprofit work, um, students that are advocating and things like that. And so that's the conversation that we are gonna have um, today with um, our uh, distinguished lecturer, as well as uh, two other um, members. So I will be moderating the panel, but I will also be um, kind of facilitating and, and participating in, in the conversation because my work does um, revolve around working with students on the University of Oklahoma campus to help and empower them to register to vote and engage um, in their elections. So we um, are going to uh, each, I've asked each panelist to provide kind of one slide um, of, of the work that they're doing. And so um, I'm going to start out um, and, and show kind of my slide on kind of the work that we're doing here at the University of Oklahoma. And then I'm gonna, we're gonna go down kind of the line. So I'll introduce each speaker um, as they um, come up and then allow them to, to provide more information about um, the current work that they're doing so that we can kind of set the stage for um, our conversation so it can move towards um, what, what we're doing in the field currently, what we're doing on college campuses, what we're doing around the country. Um, to help students and young people uh, get registered to vote and engage in voting. Um, so awesome. So just to give you a little background on the things that we're doing here at the University of Oklahoma, um, there's a lot of words and a lot of things, but what I want you to focus on is um, that we have built a lot of partnerships with um, local, but also national organizations that are helping um, youth organizations um, register students and then ultimately helping them turn out to vote. Um, so over the last several years, I've been lucky enough to engage in a couple of different programs that um, are free to college campuses. Um, one being the All In Campus Democracy Challenge, um, which helps uh, students, um, or I guess helps practitioners on university campuses um, kind of figure out some metrics, gives them tools, um, through the National Study of Learning, Voting, and Engagement, which is at Tufts University, which provides us metrics on our percentages of students that are registered to vote, um, and then provides us a voting rate um, on turnout rates for our campuses. And that's those are the numbers that you're seeing on kind of the left hand of the screen. Um, so for the University of Oklahoma in 2018 midterm, we um, our voting rate for campus was um, uh, between 30 and 39%. So we were given a, a silver seal by the, the On Campus Democracy Challenge. And then um, in the 2020 presidential election, we were uh, again given another silver seal for our campus, um, which is, um, I think, an amazing feat. Um, so we've been increasing our uh, voter registration, but then also our turnout rates um, and our voting rates for our campus over the last several years. We've had jumps that range um, about 14 to 17% um, in turnout. And that's you know, due to what our students are doing in terms of mobilizing um, our student population. Um, we are the first campus in the state of Oklahoma to be part of the voter friendly campus designation. And we were honored with that designation for the 2021, 2022 year. Um, and so that's a, a major point of pride for us. And it's all because of the things that we're doing with the All On-Campus Democracy Challenge. And then ultimately an organization called the Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition, which I'm sure we'll hear more about um, from some of the other panelists um, in the work that we're doing. But that is um, a coalition of nonprofits, um, campus practitioners, universities, people doing this work to get the youth vote out. Um, and so they are a fantastic organization to get involved with. If you 
um, are thinking about and trying to mobilize um, young people. So we've had some other achievements. Like I said, um, we've been a part of doing um, things through Campus Compact, our Oklahoma Campus Compact in our state. Um, so we've done voter registration drives. We've been honored with a number of um, grant monies to do this work. So I think it's really important that when we're utilizing student workers that we are trying to, to pay them for the work that they're doing. Um, and so kind of infusing some of that grant money has also been able to you know, help students who um, are doing a lot of hard work, registering students, <laughs> turning them out, getting them information, providing you know, toolkits, providing um, voter guides and doing all of that backend research to get paid for that work. Um, and so we've been able to do that with some partnerships through SLSV and some other granting agencies. Um, and then in 2020, I was able to, through a grant from SLSV, was able to host a statewide voting summit um, which was the first of its kind in Oklahoma. So we brought um, higher ed professionals, students um, into a, it had to be virtual because of COVID in 2020, but we brought them into that space to share best practices, to provide toolkits, to have um, speakers come in and provide information on how do, how do we do this work? How do you set up a, a voter registration table? How do you create a nonpartisan student voting coalition on your campus? How are you uh, doing a strategic plan for voting? Things like that. Um, and then some of our long-term goals are um, ultimately to expand the membership of our student organization, which is called Oklahoma Votes. Um, and then to, to do some other uh, things that are a bit of a heavier lift, like creating an on-campus polling location um, specifically for early voting. Um, in Oklahoma, we have some uh, polling locations that are adjacent to campus for day of voting. So it doesn't really make sense to utilize those efforts in um, moving a polling location, but providing expanded access um, for early voting would, I think, be really incredible. Um, and then obviously continuing to work on increased voter registration and participation, um, and then working towards the institutionalization of voter reg registration on campus, which we can get into a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, the next person that uh, is on our panel, um, Cameron Mianchik, who I have had the pleasure of working with over um, a number of years. Uh, she is a senior at the University of Oklahoma here. She is a former um, Carl Albert Center Civic Engagement Fellow um, and co-leader of our Oklahoma Votes uh, program. And right now she is working as a student advisory board member with the Campus Vote Project. So Cameron, um, I invite you to share a little bit more about what you're doing and the way that you're engaging young people um, to vote. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so as Lauren mentioned, I had the absolute privilege of getting to work with her and with the Carl Albert Center um, for two years out of my undergraduate um, time here with Oklahoma Votes. Um, and that's really where I got my start um, on this issue. I mean, where I got the chance to really learn from my peers, from former students who were involved in the program, and of course, from um, Lauren and other staff and faculty who have been doing this work for a long time. Um, so with that, I have also, as she mentioned, now am a student advisory board member for Campus Vote Project, um, which is another partner organization in that uh, student, student Learn Student Vote um, Coalition. Um, so basically, uh, Campus Vote Project is a nonprofit that really is dedicated towards helping um, train, equip students um, to be organizers, increasing voter registration, increasing uh, turnout and initiatives, um, not only with their peers, but also having conversations with um, administration to get bigger kind of lifts done on the campus level, um, and even looking into uh, policy work and what type of uh, legislation is impacting college students um, around the country. And so, this year, I've gotten the opportunity to be on that student advisory board, specifically looking at Native American research and programming, uh, which is um, something that they have never had a designated advisory board member to do. Um, they do have an initiative that focuses on HBCU outreach, but um, that is something that um, they are trying to push to be more um, to be more intentional and inclusive with reaching all students um, and having some more um, 
targeted knowledge and outreach to help um, to help students from all different types of backgrounds. Um, so to provide a little bit more context around that, um, I'm a proud citizen of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma, as well as a descendant of the Muscogee Nation. Um, aside from doing on-campus work, I'm also a voter registrar with Rock the Native Vote, which is um, based in Oklahoma City, which does um, voter registration and outreach, and also back in 2020 did a census outreach as well, um, really focusing on the Native American community. Um, there's a lot of tabling involved in that, really setting up at culture, cultural and community events, meeting people where they are, um, and starting those conversations um, in those spaces that um, that you you really do connect with with community and not necessarily just those who are already engaged, but really like the everyday everyday people. So um, I have a picture there at one of our uh, tables that was set up at um, a powwow at um, Indian Hills Powwow Grounds um, in Oklahoma City. Um, we've done tables at Indian taco sales um, at Wild Onion Dinners. Wild onions are a, a cultural food really common around some southeastern tribes um, around the springtime. Um, around conventions, church services, craft shows, um, and all-encompassing multicultural celebrations, really trying to make that presence um, and to connect with people um, and get them involved, get their questions answered. With that, I've also used that position to connect with, um, to bridge that gap and bridge those organizations. Um, so with Rock the Native Vote, um, my time at Oklahoma Votes, we've partnered on um, having tables um, at student-run powwows here at the university. Um, we've also partnered with other on-campus organizations such as um, Voto Latino or Latinos Unidos, um, which we've done some uh, National Voter Registration Day celebrations um, with them as well. So with my work with Campus Vote Project, I've really tried to take um, that knowledge that I've gained from those experiences to help um, bring that representation and bring that voice, um, such as um, whenever the new student advisory board members are um, brought in at the, at the beginning of the year, we have a kind of orientation weekend, which was over Zoom, but that was one of the things I helped out with was to plan a information session on that first day, kind of providing some historical background about um, the Native American vote um, and about some of those historical and political influences that impact um, why some people may or may not be an active voter um, if they are Native American and what are some of those common issues that Native students face. Um, with that, I've helped with some other different programming. Um, they have a, a podcast called SVN CAST, stands for Student Voting Network, and I partnered up with some other student organizers and did an episode for um, Indigenous Peoples Day, really talking with students um, who are involved in voter registration, voter outreach work um, within Native communities and within Native student communities, um, kind of hearing and uplifting some of their voices as well about um, like why the work is important to them, what they want to see, um, and what are some of the barriers that they wish that um, both Native and non-Native uh, individuals were aware of about this work and kind of what what are some are some insights that they, they feel are necessary to be uplifted. Uh, with that, um, Campus Vote Project also has a new research collective um, building on the the need for having um, data driven targeted um, outreach efforts and data collection about native students is something that really is lacking. So with that, I've also um, led a research project that I'm currently working on, it's ongoing, but it's about identifying um, factors that do influence voting amongst Native students, both barriers that may make it harder, but also motivators um, that, might, that may make it easier um, and that may help um, because that is some research that really is lacking right now um, and that I have not been able to identify. Um, and so that's something that I'm really trying to work on with Campus Vote Project. Um, as well as just generally, again, uplifting those conversations and trying to highlight um, not only Native students that are at um, predominantly white institutions, but also looking at tribal colleges and universities, as well as non-tribal Native serving um, institutions as well, um, and how they can be uh, outreached to and um, and have create those partnerships where they currently don't exist. But So that was uh, just a little bit about some of the work that I've been doing as a, as a student, both on campus and, and off. She has been uh, 
you know, such a slacker, I would say, um, <laughs> in the, the four years that she's been here um, at OU. Um, I have continued to be impressed with um, the work that you uh, continue to do and the things that you continue to um, put yourself into. So I'm excited to hear more um, about your take on some of the questions um, later on um, as we discuss through the panel. Um, so our next panelist um, that I have invited is uh, Catherine Quinton. Currently, she is the manager of census and civic engagement at Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Um, but, you know, we keep talking about this organization called uh, the Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition. Um, and that is where I met Catherine first and uh, have gotten to know her through that work for uh, many years. Um, she was their partnerships manager and um, helped me on creating my uh, my first statewide summit um, and sends the best emails um, I can uh, tell you. <laughs> She's so funny and engaging, so I'm really excited to have her um, on this panel and to tell you more about the work that she's currently doing um, and then to have a, a larger discussion um, later. So Catherine, please share uh, the work that you're doing currently. And thank you for being here. Hello, friends. Thanks for that awesome introduction, Lauren. I'm super excited to be here and appreciate the time that you all have spent coming to see us. My name is Catherine. I use she, her pronouns. I work at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, and we do a lot. We're one of the oldest civil rights organizations in the country that focuses on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, and so I'm not going to go through the full breadth of everything that we do, but things that might be interesting or relevant to you all, because, you know, we're opening up internships and we're doing a lot of these really cool things. I will not forget, the first thing I wanted to definitely share is that our applications for our Youth Leadership Summit is closing today. So if you all wanna throw an application in, um, we get a small cohort of folks to spend a week long time with us to kind of learn about the work as well as just like how to engage and build your own projects. And it's a really exciting and unique opportunity that I hope you all can apply for. Um, a couple of other really cool things we do, a lot of it is about defending and expanding the rights of Asian Americans. So one of that, like I focus around voting rights. Um, and so a couple of the really cool voting things that we work on is uh, ensuring that uh, section 203 and 208 of the Voting Rights Act are actually being implemented across the country. So for those who might not know, which was me like <laughs> a couple of years ago, was like section 203 uh, is around like, if you have a significant population of any, um, you know, limit, uh, of any particular ethnicity in a particular state. So I think, I know it's like at least 10,000 or a certain number of the population, then that jurisdiction has to provide um, language support for election materials. And so we ensure that like jurisdictions are actually complying, working with local partners uh, to show that, you know, that ballots are in language, right? That like resources are in language. So, you know, I could barely read a ballot in English. How do you expect someone where English is not their first language to be able to read it, right? Or um, in section 208 is around allowing, um, ensuring that folks uh, have their needs supported at the ballot box. So essentially that's our, you can bring a friend to the ballot, like the ballot box. So uh, you can bring your mom or your sister uh, or your cousin or your son um, to the ballot box if they, you need help translating or um, if you have a disability, you need support there. And so we do a lot of work about ensuring that there's access there. We host a voter hotline with uh, API Vote or Asian Pacific Islander American Vote called 1-888-API-VOTE, which is available in eight languages. Uh, and it's so if anyone's having any issues leading up to the election, like registration or where do you find your polling location, or I experienced um, some sort of voter intimidation that's happening, um, or there's this really concerning thing happening here, like you can call the hotline. It is um, connected to the lawyers, um, the lawyers committees 1866 our vote so we're all talking to each other and it's very interesting i've been running the hotlines like we just finished the texas hotline and one person was like i'm concerned because they said they had curbside voting and they like rolled out the voting machine to our car and i feel like that's not safe <laughs> and we're like oh good to know this is something we should write down <laughs> like this is something that we're going to continue to monitor or it's like um you know we've seen in certain states where it's like um, there would be certain police, like chiefs, like running for, like running for office. And then there will be policemen, like 
you know, at the polling locations, like really telling people in full gear to vote for them. And it could be, you know, people are very fearful. And so having people protected, but then also getting all of the resources that they need uh, to make sure that they feel safe and supported uh, going into the ballot box. Also, we do citizenship clinics. So basically folks who are eligible to become citizens, uh, we help them through that process. Uh, they can come into our clinics, they can support in doing it because it could seem like a very daunting process, like going through the process of becoming a citizen and we wanna make sure it's easy and accessible for you all. We also do an Asian American voter survey. So uh, there's a lot of exit surveys for uh, elections and things like that, but then also generally about trends, but Asian Americans are often in the other category. So you just have like, what are white folks thinking? What are black folks thinking? What are Hispanic uh, non-whites thinking? But then we're always sometimes coupled uh, in that Asian like other category. And so we really wanna ensure that, you know, our voices are heard and, you know, what are we talking about and things like that. Um, some of the other cool things we do is we do a lot of legal advocacy. We have a legal team. Um, we do lawsuits and litigation, and um, we hold states accountable with our local partners on ensuring that, you know, the access that is needed for Asian Americans is done, are like happening. Um, and then the last thing I will share is that, as you all may or may not know, there's been an increase in Asian American um, violence for the past couple of years. And so uh, Asian AJC has been at the front lines in supporting our partners and figuring out ways that we can track it so we can do it, and but also try to address it in terms of policies, education and literacy um, and trainings around like, how can we, you know, have bystander intervention? Like, how can we uh, know that we're like, what resources are available to you if you have experienced some sort of anti-Asian hate or any sort of things like that? And so that's a little bit of us in a nutshell. We'll do a lot of other things. Like we do a lot of things around immigration. Um, we do a lot of things around just like uh, supporting ugh, so many things. So highly encourage you to look at our website uh, if you're interested and happy to answer any questions that you may have about us. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Happy to have you here. Um, and then our final panelist today is our Julian J. Rothbaum Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Sunshine Hillegas, who is a professor of political science and public policy at Duke University. And um, she is going to share with us um, kind of a little short overview of um, her lectures um, to kind of, if you weren't here yesterday and you haven't been able to watch um, any of the lecture videos yet, um, to provide a grounding space for the conversation that we are kind of a about to embark on. Um, so Professor Hillegas. Hi, thank you so much for, um, you know, uh, inviting me and, and, and sharing um, with me this, this important topic. Um, so, so I really am anxious to get to people's um, questions, but really what I wanted to do is just give you a, a quick um, view of, of which lectures you might be interested in if you want to, to learn a bit more and, and maybe a, a starting place for some of our conversation. Um, so um, in addition to the, the lecture that um, we viewed yesterday that just gave an overall overview, um, you can um, find a more extensive lecture um, in which um, um, in the, the new perspective on youth turnout in which I really outline um, how it is is that we have um, thought about youth turnout in the wrong way in the past. Um, there really has been this emphasis in the past on the need to increase awareness and interest in the public as, as the potential solution to increasing youth turnout. And, um, and, and also focusing really on um, the cognitive skills that underlie um, voter turnout um, behavior and and what John Holbein and I do in our previous book um, is is to um, make the case that non-cognitive skills are an important component of um, whether somebody votes or not and and that that, that actually um, that the the real problem with respect to, to youth turnout is not that young people are not interested but they often fail to follow through on that interest and and looking at that gap between intention and and, and behavior is something that leads us to somewhat different policy solutions and so um, in uh, lectures three and four, um, one policy solution I consider is how we should 
um, reconsider civic education as it's taught in the US um, and, and really focus on the types of um, knowledge and skills that are important um, to turn out, um, and then um, especially electoral reform. So, uh, so lecture number four is really focused on the reason that so few people, uh, so few young people follow through and, and need um, non-cognitive skills is because um, the barriers to registration and voting are so high in this country. And, and so, you know, where this research is going, um, and so the, the, the next book, it really um, focuses on um, 2020 as a, a launching point. And so um, both in some of the examples that, that I give in this lecture, but, but also I think as part of the conversation for today is is to reflect on how things have changed um, even um, in the, the last two years. Um, so for example, in the space of electoral reforms, we've seen hundreds of uh, state bills introduced um, that would put voting restrictions in place that could disproportionately impact young people. And so um, I'll, I'll be talking um, a bit more about that and hope that that will be part of the conversation in, in terms of, of motivating this important topic and um, in, in how we think about some of the policy solutions. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, so as I you know, watched the lectures and as I was listening to the conversation yesterday, um, it kind of in preparation for what we were going to talk about today, but then also really in thinking about, um, you know, the work that I'm doing and how how this research potentially fits um, and, and can help me as a practitioner um, in the higher ed space. Um, so I guess the first question um, that I really want to ask the panel, um, and this is a little outside, um, you know, Professor Hillegas, um on this side, but I'm going to ask her a slightly different question after our panelists um, answer this. But how can we as practitioners in higher ed, nonprofit, student organizations, et cetera, um, use the research and findings um, and tactics that, you know, Professor Hillegas' work has um, laid out for us to support our civic engagement work from registering and mobilizing new voters to working with institutions to institutionalize voter registration and civic engagement or updating and changing voting policy, you know, at state and federal levels. Um, how, how do we see that kind of blending together? Um, I'll start with um, Catherine on this oh. one. Right out of the gate. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that there, you would want to say that people will just like listen to you face value about like, this is what we're seeing on the ground. These are the best practices that we have. But unfortunately, that is often not the case. And so uh, when I worked with colleges and universities, but even when I, you're working with like local governments or you're working with any sort of group, they're like, okay, well, where's the research on this? Well, like, what? well, you say that that's working, but maybe that's just you, right? And so I do think that like the way that we marry um, like research and then how we put these best practices together is a really good way of just showing like there is proof in the pudding that these things can happen and that these civic actions are things that can increase turnout and we can do this. And we could see that because we're, act we're doing it, but also like we could see that, you know, it's backed by research. And so having, um, like everyone has a place in the movement and knowing that like, how can we pull this all together to make sure that we are moving forward as a collective community is super important. And I think it's just really rad, right? Like it's really rad to like see and read the things that you're like in the back of your mind, like, yes, these are the things that we're doing. And then it's like so validating as organizers when you're like reading, reading a book and you're like, oh yes, okay. Like someone understands, right? Like there's, there's things written down where it's just like, uh, before a lot of times it's just like passed down from organizer to organizer you kind of learn it like Lauren when we were figuring out coalitions you were like I didn't know this and you're like you're right we're figuring it out as we go and so uh, trying to really marry those things together and um, yeah yeah absolutely Cameron what do you what do you think as a, as a student I think it's a, a slightly different perspective um, for you maybe yeah I think for for students, I think especially that that last point that Catherine hit on about like um, kind of learning as you go makes research a lot more important because if you are younger into the game, you know, you have less years of experience like personally to draw upon. 
So being able to, yeah, like exchange best practices with other people who have been in it longer is incredibly valuable. Um, and having research, you know, to look at to say, well, this is what has been shown to really be the most effective, to be, um, to be the most impactful is, a time saver, um, especially when you're working with students. Students are busy. Um, school always comes first. Um, so it's really important for students to be doing this type of work, um, but also that that um, shouldn't uh, that, that shouldn't be the top priority for students. Um, so when you have limited time and limited energy and resources to throw at doing this really important work, it's really important to be intentional and to be targeted and data-driven and research-driven. Um, and so if you have a wealth of knowledge that shows what the best practice is, it just ends up being a lot more efficient and kind of instead of asking, okay, how do we do this? Do we know this is going to work? Should we do this or this? I don't know which one's better. Um, having research to back it up at the end of the day just makes makes it more impactful for the people who are doing the work. And then, yeah, ultimately for the people who are going to also be um, targeted and reached out to and benefited from, um, from the work as well. So all around um, being able to do that's really important. And having, um, from my perspective too, looking at, especially Native students, what I'm trying to do with my research, looking with Native students is not all colleges might have um, specifically Native students uh, like a native student who is really dedicated and like multiple native students who have that you know um really close community to really learn from each other um so having research that you don't necessarily need to know somebody to get that information but that there's information that's available um that you can draw on without necessarily having that immediate network connection I think is also really valuable because word of mouth is incredibly, incredibly useful, incredibly beneficial. Um, but if you don't have that network to draw upon, if you don't have those immediate people in your circle to learn from, having research that that's published, it's out there, um, it's going to be really beneficial if you just don't have those other resources to, to gain that knowledge from as well. And I also want to add here too that like research and um, like studies and things like the book that um, Dr. Hilligus Hill has pulled out, it opens doors for folks, right? It opens doors in the sense that like funders sometimes are like, can you put a one pager about like, why do, why do we actually wanna go with this? Um, or it's like, when you wanna to talk to a president about wanting to create institutional uh, activities on campuses around voter engagement and civic engagement, like these things open doors and oftentimes like nonprofit organizations don't have the time or capacity or expertise to actually do those things. And so there's always like that, like when I mentioned before, there's a place in the movement. And um, I think that like the more research that's out there that also backs the things that we're saying on the field too, it just helps uh, create more access points for folks to be part of this work for more people to be part of the movement. So, and 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 Lauren, I know you said you had had a, a different question for me, but I, I do want to, to emphasize that I think the collaboration between practitioners um, and academics is is critical to solving, um, frankly, you know, all of the most important problems, um, in, you know, facing the nation, not not just um, youth turnout, but particularly with the case of, of youth turnout. Um, and I think the example of um, the lack of research um, on uh, participation among Native Americans is one of those examples where that type of collaboration is in fact so useful and can be very powerful because um, practitioners often are, are super super important in terms of helping to highlight the, the type of, of uh, research questions that deserve attention. Um, and then uh, furthermore, in some of my own research, collaborations with advocacy groups has provided us with um, the reach necessary to actually do the, the type of, of, of study. And so we can offer some of the rigor in terms of design of, of, of studies, but oftentimes it requires um, collaboration with practitioners. Um, one final thing I'll say with respect to, to um, my research in particular is, is one of the most um, rewarding aspects of, of the research that, that I've been involved in in the last few years has, has actually um, been when I've served as an expert witness in um, some of the litigation around these issues. And so um, I, I don't know if you've you've read the um, the acknowledgments to my book, and I won't uh, suppose that you've read the book at all, much less the acknowledgments. 
But I would say that that um, I acknowledged Tom Coburn as um, one of the uh, key people who um, uh, gives um, inspiration and, and motivation for this book. And, and it was scrutiny of the, the field of political science and criticism of the, the type of kind of navel gazing that uh, researchers often do that pushed um, uh, John, who was a, a graduate student at Duke at the time, and I into conversations about thinking about how we could apply our, our research skills um, with um, topics that, that were in fact impactful and, and not just of interest to political scientists, but also um, of policy relevance. And it was around this time that, that North Carolina um, passed a, a, a voting restriction act that, that instituted um, voter ID and, and repealed um, pre-registration. And we're like, it, and there were claims on both sides of the aisle about how impactful that would be, but there was absolutely no empirical evidence um, available um, out there in the research um, backing up those those claims by um, the the policymakers, and so that was the the motivation. And and you know I can I can give thank you know thanks to to Tom Coburn for for you know lighting a little bit of a fire in terms of um, making sure that that the research that we are spending our time and and frankly government money on is is of relevance um, to um, the the functioning of democracy. Yeah, and I, you know, to me, when like I said earlier, like when I was when I was watching the lectures and when I was thinking about this, it's really kind of the same conversation and things that you know Catherine and Cameron were thinking about. And I was like, wow, someone gets this. This is this is what I have been saying and seeing for a long time with young people. It's not that they are apathetic and that they don't want to be involved. Like and I was saying that years ago, and it, it is finally, we finally figured some things out, but I think that um, Catherine hit kind of the nail on the head about this opening doors. And I think, especially in institutions of higher ed, um, research and data, and um, that is valued at a very high level. And so when we're talking about the importance or the need um, to institutionalize this work in, in a way that, you know, is incorporated into orientation structures or incorporated into, you know, advising appointments where we're trying to ask every student, are you registered to vote or can I help you register to vote and, and what that looks like. Um, having data um, and, you know, metrics to back that up is, I think, invaluable um, because it's so easy to dismiss oh, well, okay, you're over here, you're setting up tables, you're doing student organization work, but, you know, we're in student affairs, we're the touchy-feely, we're, you know, the, the, the relational piece of this, and sometimes that, that gets lost um, in this larger conversation of, um, you know, especially at a major research institution, um, where it becomes sometimes a little less relational, and I think this blend between um, the practice side, the research side um, really has a wonderful fit. Um, and so I got really giddy about this work. And so I'm excited for the next bit. And so my question really, uh, Professor Hillegas is like, what's coming next? What, how, how is the, um, what's the next piece of research? Um, Cause I know with, you know, our lectureship, there is, um, you know, another book. So what, what does that look like? What do you see on the forefront um, of this conversation um, that's beyond uh, this that you've already done? Yeah, sure. And I mean, I, I should say that the, the book um, uh, Making Young Voters came out um, in February of 2020. Um, what an awful time to, to be thinking about trying to promote a, a book when all of a sudden, you know, COVID was the only thing that people wanted to talk about. Um, but let's think about that time frame a little bit, right? So that, that the analysis that we had done in um, that book, um, you know, the publication process takes months and months and months, you know, essentially a year. Um, so much has happened since that, that that time, and and so where you know I had a chapter on electoral reforms, um, you know the the fact that um, voting restrictions have become um, such a more prominent issue in the last two years, I think gives real focus um, uh, to the need to kind of move beyond just like 
pointing out that the problem has been misdiagnosed and instead, you know, really highlight and, and, and focus um, on um, the way that the rules of the game um, shape, um, you know, the, the likelihood that, that young people in particular are going to participate. And so, you know, as I had mentioned, um, at the state level, there's just incredible variation. Um, so many different state laws that have been um, passed, some attempting to make things easier. Oklahoma is like one of those cases where there's been, you know, some that have tried to 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 make it easier, and some that that are more restrictive. Um, um, there also, you know, no mention um, of kind of the, this federal level effort um, with HR one, the the Freedom um, to to Vote Act that was passed by the House of Representatives and and then filibustered um, by the Senate. And you know, my own view on that bill is it was covering a lot of ground um, potentially you know too much ground um, where you know campaign finance of course is a, an important topic but but you know from my perspective in terms of the barriers to, to youth turnout that i you know there are a subset of those um, uh, laws that i'm particularly interested in um, the other missing piece of the story i think um, and and this is where you know, in some ways, I wish I had a, a you know a university president on on the panel because um, are the practical issues. Um, so I I know that that this group is particularly interested in higher education. Um, one of the themes of the last book was really that that we have to start sooner than higher education. But even in within higher education, I think we need to talk about some of the practical considerations. Um, so for instance, um, voter IDs, um, you know, is a is a big push um, by, you know, Campus Vote Project and, and other um, youth advocacy organizations that has financial implications um, for colleges. The the costs associated with with um, following the the laws that state governments put in place for um, uh, student IDs to work as voter ID can be exceptionally expensive. So in the state of Wisconsin, for instance, you can only use your student ID um, if it has if if it expires within two years of it being issued. Um, you know, given that most people are uh, on campus for at least four years, right? Like you, you know, you're now talking about having to cover the cost of issuing a new and just the 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 process, right? Of of having to go through a process um, to renew an ID, and those type of practical considerations, right, are pretty daunting. Um, Elon University um, in North Carolina, um, you know, had real debates about, you know, of course, in in theory, they would love to have a student ID that met the requirements um, to serve as for voter ID. But the just the cost of changing the printing um, of that was hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And and so we have to to be cognizant of, right? What are the kind of um, practical considerations in turning what might be, you know, these relationships that we have identified and, and shown empirically, but like implementation is, it, it involves a whole nother set of, of hurdles that, that um, frankly, I don't, you know, I, I suspect that some of you could probably speak to right in, in some of your your um, individual level efforts, but but have to be kind of acknowledged in a broad scale. Yeah, so um, we're going to pivot slightly a little bit here to some of the questions that are in the chat. Um, and this this question came up yesterday talking about, um, I guess, partisanship polarization. Um, and so there are two questions that are kind of around this. Um, so I'm going to see, I'm going to start with the first one and then see if we answered somewhat the second one. Um, but the first one is, is asking, um, please kind of comment on the role that campuses and community partisan groups like young Democrats, college Republicans can play, um, can and do make, um, make on registration and turnout levels in college towns. So like, like Norman or others. Um, so does anybody want to go first? Cameron, do you want to talk about, um, I guess, what happens here on our campus and how we've, as a nonpartisan student organization, that we can partner with um, partisan groups? We can start there and then kind of go around. Yeah. So um, at least here at OU, we have multiple different um, partisan student groups. 
um, not even just college Democrats, college Republicans, um, but there's like a student leftist union, there's um, some other um, more political student groups as well that um, have active membership. And we definitely, while we are nonpartisan, being able to reach out to all of the student groups, um, I think has been really valuable because um, just trying to kind of do our own outreach as Oklahoma votes, in my opinion, is, is different from, again, forming those coalitions and forming those partnerships um, with students who are active, getting them, you know, excited and um, getting their bodies to, you know, show up at events and to help staff tables um, with the understanding that whenever they do partner with us, that it's done in a, in a nonpartisan manner, I think is really helpful for campus-wide engagement, um, just because it is reaching out to so many more individuals that are just part of our, you know, our core volunteer, you know, group and membership. Um, and I think that that's been really helpful, not only just to, again, do that outreach, get more volunteers, get more participants. Um, but, you know, in a way, I think it does maybe bridge that divide a little bit um, because you do see, you know, just to use um, the, you know, two main parties called Democrats, called Republicans. Um, this is one of kind of the only things that they might actually do together. Um, and they might see as not necessarily maybe like a mock debate where it's kind of pitted as, you know, one against the other. What if they're doing, um, if they, you know, if they both have tables at National Voter Registration Day, if they both have tables at um, a community event, um, it's not pitted as one against the other, where kind of some of their other interactions um, and events and programming might be, um, you know. Again, I don't have data, <laughs> I don't have research, but um, I think that it is one of those unique times that um, that it is viewed and seen as a community goal and as a broader goal, um, not trying to get a particular can candidate elected or not trying to further a specific policy issue, um, but getting partisan organizations to come together to collaborate and do something that's for the good of all students on the, on the campus. Um, I think does have a positive impact in not only drawing more people into the conversation, but um, having a, 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 an example um, where they might be too few of truly co collaborative um, and cooperative interactions between, you know, partisan or organizations on campus. I would love to, to, to tackle this, this question of, of um, you know, how a university can impact the broader college town. And um, I think that um, we should view, particularly for land grant institutions, that, um, you know, it can't just be um, the, the student body being the, the focus of efforts. And particularly given um, the fact that there's sometimes such fluidity between, you know, when you're a student, how many hours you're registered, and maybe one semester you're not. And, and so, um, you know, I, I would hope that um, student organizations um, really, you know, view their obligation as going kind of beyond the, the, the college institutional boundaries. And even further, it would be awesome if um, universities would embrace um, these type of initiatives um, to the extent that they would also involve alums. Again, particularly when you're talking about um, you know, a state university that the the reach that you could have by engaging not just young people but also um, the alumni, um, I, I think that the the real you know impact could just be uh, magnified not just within the college town but but also um, you know through the entire state. And as I you know pointed out yesterday, Oklahoma has some work to do in, in terms of increasing youth turnout. And so I think all hands on deck is the way to think about it. And then finally, the thing that I would just emphasize is that um, if um, college organizations can really, you know, view their mission as, as going beyond 
just the, the college student body, although I know some of these initiatives really are focused on college students and the competition across colleges are terrific and really have been effective at, at, at sometimes increasing turnout among student bodies, um, that um, turning to the high schools um, would be, um, you know, just I would return to that theme that, um, you know, this is that that catching young people when they are coming of age um, is of such critical critical importance and and you know college students I, I think are uniquely situated to um, be able to you know really have an impact on on high school students and and how they view um, and the importance of, of civic engagement and and particularly if you can take some of the lessons of the challenges that college students faced and you know the common and mistakes that, that get made, these are the things that aren't being talked about in civics classes, right? And and so I think are an opportunity um, for, for impact. Yeah, I think, love it, Dr. Hill, I guess I think that there is a lot to be said around like, how do we um, bridge the communities between like colleges and the, the community? I'd also just be like, there's ways to do it uh, where it's thoughtful. Oftentimes there's a lot of tension between college universities and the local communities, because if you think about like, oftentimes, especially in college, I went to Florida State, we were definitely a college town um, where there is like a, a financial diaspora there, right? And so making sure that we're, you know, thoughtful and careful and not, you know, coming in as like a white savior. And I know that everyone on this panel knows this is just something that, you know, I'm always hyper aware of. It's just like college students supporting local communities seems like a really great headline, but at the same time, uh, it often, um, you know, undervalues like the community is also supporting themselves and how can the colleges amplify what they're exist they're doing existingly and not, you know, just being like, we got like, we know what's best for you. And back to the uh, question that was in the, the, that someone in the chat raised around just like, what is the role of partisan groups on campus? I will say it again, and I'll say it a hundred times that there's always a, a place in the movement for everyone. And I think that oftentimes when we talk about voter registration and turnout on campus is always like, we have to be nonpartisan, nonpartisan, but we always have to remember that nonpartisan doesn't mean non-political. And so, you know, we can be getting those people to do that first step around voter registration, but for us to continuously engage, there's only so much that Lauren and Cameron can do on a daily basis. You have thousands of students on campus and um, having college Democrats have college Republicans as a way, as an outlet, and as a, a resource for folks to know what's going on, especially when it comes to the primaries, right? Like primaries, it's not like someone is voting in both of the, of the elections, right? Like they need to know what's going on in each of their parties. They want to find resources and they want to find resources in a language they can understand by people, by peers that they can like, um, that they can align with, right? And so, especially when around the primaries, I think that there's a huge push that voter registration and turnout can be supportive by partisan groups. I also think that when groups like the leftist groups, the rightist groups, or whatever we want to call them um, on campus, because like Cameron mentioned, it's not just the college Republicans and college Democrats come together and doing voter registration fairs, it increases the trust that campuses uh, like students have in that process. Knowing that political parties can um, set aside their political differences, knowing that every student who is eligible should be part of, part of the process. And so having people come together, doing voter registration drives together, doing uh, campaigns together, knowing that they can trust that since there's both parties involved, as well as the campuses involved, that their voter registration is in good hands, um, that they know that there is like a process that we can trust, I think is really good because I think that there is a lot of distrust wh wherever you line on like the other party. And so um, having people come together and knowing that like, yes, voting is an integral part of our democracy and that everyone should participate and that we all want people to increase voting um, and increase our voter registration, I think is imperative and like partisan groups can help build that trust if they come with good faith, they work with their campuses and they support each other. And I'd also challenge campuses to be like, it is okay to work with partisan groups, but just knowing where your line stops, right? Knowing where you stop in terms of your professionalism. And so I think it's, it's great. Like work is great, you know? Yeah, I mean, I agree. And I think that it's, um, you know, obviously the work that, that we do is nonpartisan, but it, many times we're we're partnering with those partisan groups, and I I do think that it is about trust, and I think it it's about some boundaries, like you were saying, like where where do we begin and or like where do we end and you begin, because I think a lot of that too is a lot of students that come to us, and I think this will get to the next 
question and kind of lead into the next question, but a lot of students that come to us are, are seeking out information that is nonpartisan. They're trying to enter the process. They're trying to understand, um, you know, what is voting? How do I register? And so they're not, they're not yet in a partisan mindset, but what we're always trying to do is to provide education, link them into what is the next step for you? So once they feel engaged and they feel empowered um, to find out more information, to start researching um, the various issues that they might, you know, think about. And I think um, particularly about a lot of students asking like, well, you know, I, it's like, what should I care about? What are, what are the things that I'm voting on? Um, and, you know, I am always telling students it's, it's not what I'm, what I care about or what candidates care about. It's like, what, what, what motivates you? What are your core issues? What are the things that you want to, to make sure that candidates know are important to you? Um, and then that's how you kind of need to identify. And that doesn't necessarily mean that like you have to be educated on all things and everything. Um, and I think Dr. Hilligas talks about, about this, you know, she talked about this in the lectures and she talked about this yesterday about, you know, students think that they have to be perfect and they have to know everything about voting and everything about every issue and every candidate um, to be an informed voter. Um, but I think where our, our partisan groups really come in is once they've start, started to figure out, okay, where, where do I fit? Um, they're providing resources on candidates. Most of them are bringing candidates to campus. Um, we try to provide, you know, nonpartisan spaces to do that, but it's not always easy. So, you know, they have access to um, the party, right? So what is the party platform? Um, opportunities to volunteer on campaigns, um, to get engaged in those spaces, community. They're doing other things outside. And so it provides the next step. It's like the link in the process. And so we're the starting point, um, but then, you know, they take that on and, and kind of it's the next piece. Um, so I see it as a great kind of transitional um, aspect of that. And so the next kind of question is, um, there's a long um, description, but I think what it boils down to is um, the large majority of the electorate and specifically young people that are moving into the space of independent voting um, or wanting to be registered as, as independents. Um, and so what are our thoughts on the, um, or specifically about independent candidates potentially gaining popularity and becoming a political trend for um, electing government representatives? Because to this point, um, it's been very challenging for independent candidates um, to get elected, it's really been this two-party system. Um, so if anybody has any thoughts on that, and I think probably- Yeah, Dr. I was gonna say, as a, as a political <laughs> scientist, I'll jump in and dash all hopes. Um, yes. So, you know, I, I think uh, Mike or any of the other political scientists can can weigh in here, um, you know, but, but um, you know, the, the rules of the game matter. The rules of the game matter, not only for young people in voting, but the, who is, is, is able to get on the ballot. And, and, you know, it is the case in the US that we just don't have a system that that um, really makes it possible in most cases to have viable um, third party candidates. Now, um, you know, there's a whole separate day we could spend talking about that. I think I would like to bring it back to the relevance for young people and, and the relevance for the work that youth advocacy groups are doing because one of the things that I, I have talked about was, was that young people kind of hold themselves to too high of a standard in terms of how much they need to know in order to be good voters. I also think that one of the risks of um, some of the common approaches to youth mobilization, um, you know, really um, build up hopes and expectations so high um, that inevitably, right, it is um, the, that um, after you cast your first ballot, right, or after you support your, your first candidate, that your heart will be broken. Um, it is, it, you know, it is an inevitable part of American politics um, that, you know, independents are unlikely um, to, to win in, in almost um, all circumstances. <laughs> you know, there are very, very 
very rare exceptions. Um, and um, we are simply not going to get our dream candidate and dream policies with a single vote. And 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 those are realities and misperceptions that that we should be pursuing um, mobilization. Um, you know, despite that, right? And and with that, with our eyes open. Um, and and so one of the things that that I have long worried about um, it, it, with, with respect to 2022 um, is, you know, the hangover from 2020, right? And, and um, you know, we, we really saw this uh, during the Obama administration. Um, we, you know, we see this with every administration. <laughs> and so, so there's actually, a, you know, a very predictable pattern um, in, in the um, public opinion data. So, so you know, we will be disappointed, um, you know, the day, the, the, you know, the, the year after um, we elect our preferred candidate, and and that's just a reality of the system, and and yet it is still important that we participate, um, and and. Um, you know the the idea that it's all you know we're going to snap our fingers and there's going to be one election and everything is going to be unicorn and roses right is is not the vision that we need to be selling um in mobilizing young people i don't think it is and you know necessarily what young people think is going to happen but but i think it's very important that we um as educators, um, as advocates, um, are are realistic in both what can be accomplished in a single election cycle, um, you know, and um, as well as right, um, what um, what you know the, that the the most important thing is to 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 show up. Um, it's it's not the depth of your um, you know research about any given candidate or or issue. Um, so uh, you know, I'll will stop there. But but just a, a little bit of a you know um, uh, a warning of of the the risk of when we get caught up in the campaign, right? That we can sometimes um, you know I worry I worry about um, the the damage that can do. My favorite example of what you're trying to oh, of what you're saying is like we're not buying when we're voting we're not finding our soulmate we're buying a bus ticket right? Like, we are not finding our soulmate. We're not finding our one true love. Like, you know, we're finding a bus ticket that gets us closest to the what we actually want, right? Are you going a bus ticket in this direction or going in the bus ticket in the, in, in the other direction? And so every time you buy a bus ticket, you'll get closer and closer into the direction that you want. And you're continuously, um, sometimes when you buy the bus ticket, and then sometimes that bus disappears, right? You're like, oh, that route doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> okay, find another route that's also closest to us, buy that bus ticket, right? And I think that, you know, I love this idea of like, yeah, setting up realistic expectations for folks, because I remember distinctly in the 2016 elections, like my sister calling me at like two in the morning, I've worked 14 hours on the election, her crying like to me and just being like I don't know what to do this was my first election how am I supposed to like be a part of this again and I didn't know what to say to, to her like bone crushing I can't be like think of it as a bus ticket when she's like crying at two in the morning um but setting up those expectations for young folks to just be like yes we hear you. We want to have all of these things. Everyone has all of these issues that they care about. Find that bus ticket to get you in that right direction. And when it comes to independent candidates, on the federal level, it's real hard. <laughs> There's a reason why we only have really one independent uh, senator who really aligns with one party. Um, and but it can really happen on the local levels, right? When it comes to your uh, city council, oftentimes they are just independent candidates, and certain states won't even allow parties to like be really engaged in city board uh, elections. Um, I, I've seen a lot of city council races being won on an independent, and so I think, you know, the more bus tickets and routes that you have to offer, it like always helps. Um, and to those who are interested in filing as an independent, like. That is okay too. I think everyone has their own journeys and they want to make sure that they are aligning with the bus ticket. And they're like, I don't want to go this way. I don't go this way. I want to go this way. And I think that is totally fine. Um, and that is the opti optimist in me. And I become more and more pessimistic, <laughs> you know, as we get closer to the election. Um, but I just really wanted to highlight, yes, we, we are figuring it out. And I think, uh, especially on the local levels, I've seen students run as independents and win elections. I'm just throwing it out there. Anyone can run for an election. Any, anyone can be an elected official. Um, 
you know, it's just all about like, do you, do you, are you in the community? Do you support uh, the things happening? How are you supporting the people around you? And so anything can happen. Yeah, I mean, look at me, anyone can be an elected official. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but I mean, I think you're, I think you're right. So, I mean, our, our city council elections are nonpartisan. Um, and so we don't run with that. And that, that was going to kind of be my take on this is that, but I mean, but caveat to that too, that I think that there is this challenge with um, either running as an independent or running even in a nonpartisan is this idea of trying to provide contrast between you and another candidate and, and how you do that um, has typically been by the party that you have, you know, the, the D or the R, or, you know, whatever behind your name. And so I think that that is what something that is really challenging for independent candidates, because people are searching for that contrast, like what, what is this overarching, um, I guess, ideology or understanding that you come to the table with. And so um, that becomes easy for people to, um, I guess, categorize you as like, oh, this person I can get behind because I understand that like, yes, I might not agree with them on all things, but their general philosophy is what I agree with because of that, that partisan nature. Um, so I would, I would encourage independent voters or independent um, pe people that want to run as candidates and independent, like think about what is the thing that sets you apart? How are you going to contrast yourself um, with whoever you're running against? Um, and I think that can be done, um, but you have to be really strategic about what are, how are you doing that and providing that contrast. Um, and I think you're going to have to be really, um, provide a lot of information, um, like on a website or with the, the words that you're using. Um, and I think that becomes easier with potentially, you know, running against an incumbent, but then there's all kinds of problems with running against incumbents, um, and things like that. So it, it probably, you know, our system really is not structured um, for that. But all of that to say that at local election levels, it's probably much easier to start there um, and kind of figure out how, how this structures. Um, Absolutely. I, I would say local elections are, are, are a true, you know, one, one of the, the few, you know, exceptions. I, I would just highlight uh, nonpartisan is not necessarily independent, right? And, and so, you know, if the rules of the game are that you can't list a, a party, that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's um, you know, ideology or preferences. And, and so let me just um, answer, you know, it, let, let me make one point, and I know that, that Cameron probably wants to jump in, but one point that also I, I think answers Joel's question um, about ranked choice voting, and, and that is, is when you remove the, the partisan label, right, you have, you have made the task so much more cognitively difficult um, for people to make up their mind. And, and that is the challenge of ranked choice voting as well. Yes, theoretically, absolutely, um, that, that it offers uh, a number of the solutions to the ills of our political system. Um, and in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm part of a new um, election reform commission that, that you know, is kind of actively advocating for, for ranked choice voting. Um, but, but I think, I, you know, I want to be very careful in, in also talking about the trade-offs. Uh, um, and the trade-offs are, are that, that, you know, a party is a heuristic um, that is very useful. And, and when we have to think about, you know, the, the implications of, of re removing that or complicating the kind of single, like, do you use the D or the R in, 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 in that type of simplified decision making? And so um, is it my first choice in terms, you know, ranked choice is not necessarily my first choice in, in terms of, you know, how to, to reform the ills of the American political system. Um, but, but certainly, um, you know, theoretically, um, it, it, um, offers some advantages because the primary system is, of course, you know, one of the the key um, is one of the drivers um, of of the polarization um, that we're seeing. Cameron, we'll bring you into the into, into the fold. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say yeah, exactly what um, Dr. Hilovich just said about um, like the party, the designations being a heuristic, and especially for. Um, a lot of young people and a lot of students, as as I think you mentioned, Lauren, like 
there's a fear that I think is a lot more noticeable between young people that they feel like they have to know everything and they don't feel qualified probably because there is a, you know, very common like societal echo that, oh, well, young people are just apathetic. Young people aren't involved. You know, young people just aren't paying attention to what's going on. And so then young people are also hearing that and being like, well, I, I, I have opinions, but I just, I guess I don't know enough. And it's an insecurity um, that a lot of people have. I think a lot of young people almost to the point where um, I, I notice a lot of people feel almost like ashamed if they say like, oh, I'm not like that political. Like, I don't really, like, I'm not really involved. And it's not like a, most of the time it's not like a, oh, I don't care. It's like almost something that they, they feel sorry for, or like they feel embarrassed of because they know it's important and maybe they want to, but they just kind of feel, feel like they're not allowed to because of these informal um, sayings of, oh, you don't know enough. So, you know, even though they might not really feel strongly about adhering to one, you know, a certain party or another, that is something that does indicate values and does indicate, you know, some different policy positions to some people. And so um, having, even though they might not personally identify, having those designations is something that can be really useful, um, at least as kind of a jumping off point and just a, well, I might not know everything, but at least I kind of know, you know, this. And I think that that that's what's going to help me make this decision is, you know, something I think shouldn't, shouldn't be knocked, uh, you know, because for some people, um, they might not have all of the time to, you know, really do a deep dive into some of these policy, policy provisions, but that might be something that they know, um, and something that, that, that they value. And I think that this is just the, the big important thing about just like, how are we creating a culture of positivity around voting? And then also how are we, you know, expanding on voter education? And so like, Totally, Cameron. Like I, I vote twice a year, every year in Virginia. We have an election every single year, <laughs> and some it gets very overwhelming. I was like, so many candidates, so many things going on, and so like when people, even without them saying anything, you should just be like, it is super easy, you know, to do it. Like if you align with the party, you know, when you go there, there's probably someone there who will give you like, a, like a ballot, like a pre-filled ballot that you could like look at or you could go on ballot ready and you can like build your own ballot so then when you go into the ballot box you could just look at your thing and it's just kind of like a cheat sheet because you've already done your research beforehand and people has already pulled it together and the question around like does ranked choice voting increase voter participation I am to the point I have a lot of thoughts about ranked choice voting too positive and negative but I think that a lot of it is it's less about the actual process of voting and it's about how can we ensure that the experiences of the people who are voting is a positive experience that we can continue to reinforce that it is something that you should continue to do because it is part of your very identity a core person of like why it's so important to you personally and that's how you build that up and whether it become as like easy or as complicated as like the voting process itself is making people feel comfortable and safe when they're doing that voting process that they can feel confident when they leave, regardless of what the process is. Yeah, and I also want I also want to jump in too about this conversation about you know like having this understanding and like having a a party um, behind the name right and saying like this is what candidates feel about. I don't think that any of us are you know, advocating for straight party voting or not doing research or not being informed, but um, that it does provide, you know, some level of, um, you know, understanding um, besides going into like an extreme deep dive, which I think some students believe that they have to do. And so a lot of the work that, you know, I do, and I think a lot of people that are in my position working with students and you know student organization groups are trying to reduce that anxiety and that stress by um, pulling information together by um, providing websites or one-stop shops to candidate information like here's all of the websites and so that students don't have to go and find and dig through you know Facebook pages and the internet and all of this kind of stuff. And, you know, and I, I see, um, I think some people from the League of Women Voters, like there are organizations like that that are providing, um, you know, candidate um, information in one place, um, you know, 
that I think is really important to also in advancing this work and to providing access to, to people to feel more informed. Um, so they're asking questions that then candidates can respond to. And I think then when candidates don't respond to those things that that's, that's also um, can be telling sometimes as well. Um, so I'm looking at those things, you know, both as, as a candidate and then as, you know, a regular citizen, um, how, how, how am I providing information to, to the public? Um, and so I think all of, all of those different things, and then kind of to bring it back to this conversation about ranked choice voting, um, I think that we do need to start thinking about what does our voting structure look like and how, how do we best incorporate changes that um, help advance um, and create access for more people um, but I think, and you know, Dr. Crespin and I have talked about ranked choice voting um, kind of a number of times, but thinking, and I think there are some other models out there that do something similar, but it's a different structures. And um, I haven't looked, you know, into all of those, but um, I think in municipal elections or elections at the local level, this is really where some of those things can be tested. Um, I don't think that we can really go full throttle um, right into, you know, presidential election year, ranked choice voting for everything. Um, I think that that might be a mistake, but there are opportunities maybe at municipal levels where, you know, we're not, we're running um, without partisan races and they've got, you know, we just had a mayoral election um, in uh, February and we had five candidates. And so when you have five candidates, we've got to go to a runoff. And so that creates another election. That's more money. That's more time. That's more campaigning. Um, and so what does, what and does lower turnout, like, <laughs> right. And then lower turnout and voter fatigue and all of these things that just complicate the system. And so implementing something like a ranked choice voting in that scenario, I think would heighten, um, you know, people's trust, <laughs> um, and access and, um, to also really think about, um, you know, hey, look, we're we're being fiscally responsible because we're not, you know, taking all of this extra time and money um, to provide another election, um, and so we can kind of get back to the business of just governing. Um, so I think, you know, it's a really interesting conversation about kind of electoral reform and what what we're trying to do. Um, we're going to, I guess, pivot slightly. There's another question kind of, I guess, really about organizing and kind of how, how we engage with um, our communities. And um, so it's, the question is, do you find that trust is higher um, if those doing registration are from the community being approached? Um, and so I, I, mean, I, I would say off the top that this is a pretty easy answer, yes. Um, but I think there's a lot of nuances with that. Um, and I think Cameron and Catherine can really talk a lot about um, what this looks like in their particular community. So um, Cameron, let's start with you about, you can probably talk um, about the native community specifically and what this looks like. Yeah, so I definitely think 100% yes. Um, especially this is something I try to do a lot with campus vote project and making sure that student organizers um, are aware whether that be like so the orientation presentation or these resources like you know a podcast that they all have access to um, because you know a lot of people no matter what community you come from can have understandably a healthy level of distrust like that that's always going to exist in in you know all communities but for some communities there is more distrust and oftentimes from, you know, historical policies, ongoing policies that have shaped what it means to engage in a political system. And I think especially for the native community in particular, um, the native community, if you did not know, um, tribes are our nations. Tribes have, if you are a member of a tribe, you are also a citizen of a tribe. Um, and of course, these tribal governments stretch, you know, before the United States existed. So the dynamic of participating in, um, in, in a sense, validating a political system that um, maybe, you know, you or some people in your family might feel strongly about um, maybe not being the political system for you, um, 
being it not a system that was designed for you, having someone um, who is an outsider try to kind of convince you and pull you into that system can be like a a red flag almost like you just don't want to engage because they don't they don't get it they don't understand um and you know sometimes even really well intentioned organizers can easily um you know come off as being insensitive in some of these spaces um, by not being kind of aware of some of the opinions and really being engaged with what the community thinks um so i think it really does make a difference if you do have someone who's doing that work who does know um, and especially with, with um, you know, some students and some organizers, it's all about, you know, we know it's good. So we're going to, you know, really push and, um, you know, we want everyone to be engaged. It's, you know, it's good to be engaged. Um, but also, again, not attaching like a shame if you're not um, and kind of having that understanding that, yeah, like that can be hard um, for some people. It can feel like almost a betrayal in some way and not making someone feel bad, you know, or, or feel uh, less than, or, you know, impose these, you know, negative values on their, on their decisions and their opinions um, for maybe not, not agreeing. Um, and that's okay, you know, and having that, that full, that full knowledge and understanding as to, as, as to why they might feel like that, um, or have those opinions, um, and carrying those with you, and being able to address those in, in a meaningful way when doing outreach, when doing outreach, and when having these, these conversations with individuals and, um, again, even if it's, you know, not just like the people who are doing it, but the context where it's at, as I mentioned, a lot of what we do with Rock the Native Vote is meeting people where they're at, um, at a lot of powwows and, and dances. Um, there's also like vendors, a ton of vendors, craft vendors selling beadwork and selling, you know, um, clothing and, you know, food that are all around the event with these tables. So we know that a lot of people, if they're not watching or if they're not dancing or, you know, participating, they're going to be walking around these booths and these stalls and they're going to be taking their time because they want to look at all of the earrings that are on the table. And, you know, they're, they're going to be want to, you know, wanting to look and, you know, engage with the vendors, maybe bargain some prices. And so um, that's a really good opportunity to be there because, you know, they're going to be taking their time and they're not going to be in a rush, you know, they're going to be there, you know, with the, with, you know, some time to invest um, and not making anyone have to go out of their way to get these questions answered, you know, or to get this service done. And so, yeah, not just having someone from, from the community doing that work, but being, uh, being very intentional about where are we going to see where this community might, might, might need or might have space to, to fill their needs. Um, and it, you know, meeting people where they are, not making them go out of their way, so. Yeah, I think to address this question too, I also wanna, yes, it's it, it, like we're meeting folks where we are, especially when it comes to like, um, when you're coming from a minor, minority community, you like know where the folks are, right? That's why it's easier to register folks, you know, if you know the places where people are going to be, they're not just generally at the malls or at the union or wherever you wanna call it. I think that there's also a little bit I, like I have a story. So like in 2016, I was at, working at API Vote. I worked with a bunch of ambassadors across the country. And one of the things we wanted them to do is participate in National Voter Registration Day. And this was, you know, a lot of campuses were still figuring out their institutional practices. They weren't really working with student groups a lot, a lot and especially with Asian American campuses. And so um, I had a, a group who was like, well, we can't do it until like Thursday after National Voter Registration Day. Is that okay? And I said, sure, that's okay. And they were able to register 400 people on their campus. Um, and this was after their campus was like, oh my God, this was the biggest voter registration thing on our campus. We've registered so many people. And I was like, wow, like I'm so impressed that you were able to register so many people afterwards. Like, did you talk to them about like, you know, about that or, you know, talk to the people you registered? And they're like, yeah, most of our folks didn't even know that National Voter Registration Day was a thing. No one asked us. And I think that there is a perpetual foreigner like issue when it comes to folks who are Latinx, who are Asian American about like, you're not a citizen. <laughs> like you can't vote. You're not part of this process. And no one asks. I had an intern who came to me where she was like, I was like, why did you want to join this internship? And she was like, well, like I sat in front of a voter registration booth on campus for an hour and no one asked me to register to vote. And when I approached them about it, they said, oh, I thought you were an international student. 
And so you were not eligible to vote. And so I do think when it comes to, yes, it's about like us feeling comfortable, us feeling safe, talking to other people, especially where your histories are in alignment, but it's also about that cultural competency piece of it too, right? Um, we have to teach our volunteers that you have to ask everyone in a way that doesn't try to out their citizenship status. I totally understand that fear, making sure that you're like, do you wanna update your voter registration? How can we support you? But also there is this perpetual foreigner like experience that a lot of uh, Asian Americans and Latinx folks have to deal with of like oftentimes people think that we're just not part of the process because we don't care or we're not a citizen or we're not eligible. And so I do think I really want to nail on that head of like when we're doing this work, you have to invite everyone into the process. Like oftentimes I'm in spaces and like me physically just being there, not even saying anything, they're like, yes, we have to talk about all of these and the Asian American vote, yes. And I was just like, yeah, like that reminder of, yes, we are part of our democracy, we're part of that electorate. And so I do think like to this point, yes, like there is a point in the movement of organizations and like working with folks um, to ensure that people who look like you are asking you those questions and you're supporting those people who uh, are helping their own communities. Yeah, I wanna, you said something too about like um, not being asked and that's, a big thing with young people too, and especially with you know young people um, who come from these other backgrounds as well, um, is that you know because there are stereotypes about you know not participating, not being active, then when it comes to election time about like get out the vote efforts, um, you know it's it's not our communities that are being targeted as we need to ask them to vote, we need to ask them to show up, we need to ask them to register. And just that, that just very sense of, you know, being asked, being kind of, you know, brought in, into the system, someone, you know, seeing you, identifying you um, is validating um, and is empowering. And kind of those, you know, if if other people aren't going to do it, like it has to be ourselves, <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, every, every organization should definitely be, um, be inclusive and in doing, you know, doing outreach. But, you know, when it's, when it's, when it's your own community, um, it definitely is like let, let's uplift ourselves. Let's not wait for someone to come along and ask us. Let's let's do the work ourselves and ask ask each other. And a lot of folks have been, and I totally get it. I totally understand. A lot of folks focus on voter registration so much. A lot of the questions around voter registration. I know voter registration is a fundamental part of actually voting, but I do think that like a lot of organizations, we have to really focus on that GOTV part. Voter registration is easy. You can do it right then and there with that person. <laughs> like you could just be like, come, I have cookies that are offered to everyone, but you can get a special, but equally the same cookie <laughs> you register with me. Um, but we also have to make sure we're following through and getting people to actually go to the polls because um, that is something where people are like, voter registration, phew, we did our job. But you're like, if people are not going to the polls, then what was the point of registering them in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's been the big thing. Like a lot of our work has really started in the beginning around like registering students to vote. And it felt like, woo, we did it. And then we got, you know, our, our NSOL data. And I was like, we did not do it. We are not turning students out. Like there's this, this massive gap. And I think Dr. Hilligas talks about this, right? This, this intention gap um, of, you know, students intend or young, young people intend to vote. Um, so yeah, they're registered to vote, but that doesn't necessarily, that's only the first piece. That's like step one. Um, and then, you know, the next piece is, you know, finding out all the information and then like the finish line is um you know submitting your ballot on election day or you know submitting your absentee ballot or early voting or you know whatever it is to get you across the finish line and then continually doing that in every subsequent election for the rest of your life i mean that's that's the hope right and so um i guess i want to talk a little bit about that like okay we we've gotten students or young people to register to vote, like what's next? What is the next work? How are we organizing around and supporting young people, um, you know, in, in that GOTV, in those GOT efforts? Like, what does that look like? So I, I might jump in because, you know, I, I have like, you know, really said that, um, you know, I've kind of bashed on, <laughs> you know, rock the boat type of, of, of mission. And it's not to, um, 
you know, not to say that they, they don't play an important role, but just, you know, if we think about follow through that, that even some of the emphasis uh, for GOTV might change, right? So, you know, rather than spending money um, on, um, you know, a celebrity, um, you know, TV ad, maybe you need to send out calendar reminders. Um, maybe you need to find for a given area what the actual barriers in terms of getting to the polling location um you know uh i know organizations are, are doing this more but but also you know the the um line um on election day um you know so things like if there's a long line providing water and pizza unless you're in the state of georgia where that's now illegal um but but thinking about what are the things that could be the obstacles to follow through right like if, if we focus on those activities um, whether you're talking about registration or you know the 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 actual showing up to vote um after the fact you know maybe it's providing postage right maybe it's um you know helping in the state of oklahoma one of these states that requires notarization um you know I, I, and and mike has has talked about right like that that you know trying to make notaries available but you know you know maybe you you wander the campus to the dorms with, you know with the notary and and uh, you know a bunch of postage stamps um these are the type of things that we have to think about in terms of like where are the priorities the priorities are not i frankly think that like where you said the next step is is you know getting the information that can be that can be also an endpoint unfortunately right like it can also be where somebody's like oh my gosh i have so many links i need to click through um and yes that's easier than searching for everything but but i think you know again that's where it's so important i think that we get this message across about just living your daily life you learn enough to be a good voter, right? You, you know enough to represent your interests at the ballot box. Um, now, yes, you can do more. Everything else is bonus. Everything else is just, you know, is is just the the, the cherry on top and is going to solidify um, what your um, decision is, is going to be. But but just by living our lives, we can. Um, you know, usually figure out, um, you know, how to how to represent our interests at the ballot box. So, again, I, and I'll stop there because you know, uh, Catherine and Cameron are obviously the the experts in in terms of the GOTV. But but I would say that there are some things, right? That if we think about the real hurdle is about follow through, that it might shift priorities in terms of of what type of activities we might engage in. Yeah, I think. Oh, I had a thought while you were talking. I was like, oh, let me hold on to it. <laughs> I think I lost it. But I think that there's just so many opportunities out there for, uh, oh, yes, I remember. So I think the follow through is really, really important too. And I think we have seen that if people make a plan to vote, that they're more likely to vote. And making it easier to vote is like the, the, the like, of course, like, oh, gosh, what are words? For example, like having on-campus polling locations is really important or having shuttles to go to and from. Uh, like Carmen, who is actually part of SLSB, who is my former team member, her and I, we went to University of Arizona and I thought I was gonna smooth sail on election day. They had seven hour lines there. We bought um, pizza and we sold out of pizza in a five mile deliverable radius. Like we didn't have enough pizza to keep for those students to stay there. We bought chicken tenders because we were like, that this was pre-COVID, mind you, but like that was the way that we kept people in the lines. And so making sure that we're investing in like having people make a plan, radical idea. Like how do we get like phone numbers of people across campus so we can call folks and just be like, have you made a plan to vote? Because when you're just like, you know, they're like, I have class, I have this. You're like, do you know you have early voting? Or like, do you know you can, oh, you have all these classes? Well, you can just drop by here. This is where you can do it. You can go vote. And I remember what I was going to say uh, when Dr. Hilligus was talking. It's not a test. Voting is not a test, right? Like no one's going to grade you on how well you did on who you vote for. And so I love this idea of like, um, you are informed enough to vote, right? And like whatever you put on that ballot is enough. Like you don't have to fill out all the bubbles if you don't feel comfortable. We encourage you to, of course, but you totally can. You're not getting graded. This is something that is between you and that ballot and that's totally okay. And I think for students, it's like, yeah, that idea of perfectionism and you're like, no, <laughs> 
Joe Biden is not going to be like, you got a D on your ballot, right? Like you get, it's a pass fail. You go or you don't, right? Like it's going to be great. It's going to be okay. Um, and yeah, I think when it comes to working with organizations to really push, do the dorm storming, right? Going to dorms, helping people like make sure that they make their plans to vote. Invite a friend. There's like that vote tripling model where you're like, ask three friends to vote. Or like, I have lived in DC for five years and I have voted with my friend. 10 times now <laughs> together every single year. Um, actually, no, nine times. One time I did it by myself. I was really sad. But like, we, may, we make it a thing. Election is like a fun thing. We like our chat is called the voting squad because we always vote together, right? It's like a fun and celebratory thing. And you can always, if you can't, um, if you could just get one other person to vote with you, then you've already doubled your vote, regardless of who you vote for, right? Um, and you should encourage your parents to vote too. Yes, definitely resources, resources, resources. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that was just what I was really thinking of listening to Dr. Hillegas talk about um, the, 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 the like intention gap and about um, meeting that because a lot of people want to, but with students, again, yeah, students being, you know, obviously students going to classes, probably having a job, probably having um, extracurriculars and a lot, a lot on our plate. There's a reason why uh, college students, you know, are always like, oh yeah, they're like addicted to coffee and like they never sleep because like we're always so busy. So um, being able to know how to go vote and being able to yeah offer those reminders, we um, are able to uh, send alerts um, through TurboVote if people register through that and they get reminders about um, when elections are, because people forget, like people honestly, with all the best intentions in the world really want to and can get busy and just simply forget. Um, and then again, that, you know, not being intimidated or feeling like you don't know enough and like you need to do all of this independent, deep diving research um, in order to go vote. Love voter guides, love, you know, all the hard work that a lot of organizations put into creating like easily accessible, digestible information that gives people the highlights because you don't need to know every single policy position and every single previous action, you know, or, um, or qualification that a candidate has to be able to just, you know, pull them up and have just a few things and be able to make your decision. It doesn't need to be rocket science. It can be easy, um, but there's definitely having yeah, ha having voter guides and organizations that provide that information to make it more easily accessible for people who might not have the most time or knowledge or know how to really do those those deep dives is something that I see is really, really valuable and helpful for students. Um, also just something I yeah, transportation, getting to the polls. I also had a really long um, six hour early uh, voting line. Um, uh, for the 2020 presidential election. That was, yeah, a six hour early voting um, line that, I mean, people, I'm lucky I don't work on weekends because that is, that is inaccessible. Um, so having more um, opportunities for people to go vote, um, free at campuses, having um, holidays that, you know, allow people to free up some more time in their schedules, you know, if, if they're able to cancel classes on election day. Um, that's wonderful too. So people do have that extra time. Um, and just transportation like itself, I, I know, especially on, um, for a lot of freshmen, I didn't have a car on campus my freshman year. Um, and that's not, you know, that much of a unique situation. Um, if something is beyond walking distance, or maybe if, you know, it's just bad weather and you don't want to walk, um, being able to have either like a, yeah, like a, a university, you know, shuttles, if that's possible, or just like informal community carpooling, you know, having your friends to go vote with you and extending that invite to, you know, your group me chat with, you know, some, some, some like other classes or like student organizations. I mean, it's really doing that outreach to make sure that, you know, everybody has those opportunities to get where they need to go, to know enough to feel confident in making a decision um, and just to really be able to plan out that time, um, and to be prepared and to really just feel, feel prepared overall. Um, but that does take resources and that takes follow-up and that takes, um, you know, ongoing efforts and, 
uh, it's too much for one organization, which is why having things like the SLSB coalition and, you know, more local, you know, coalitions and organizations all working together is really important because, yeah, everyone can have a seat at the table when it comes to people doing the work too. Um, you might not be, you know, you, you might not have the policy background to really be putting together those voter guides, um, but maybe you have that graphic design background so you can make them look pretty and easy, uh, easy to read. Um, or maybe you have a you have a car with the extra seat. You can you can give someone a ride. Um, so it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be a huge lift. Um, but just a lot of little things that need to get done um, that just require coordination and just compassion and time just to get just to get it done. Um, and it's you know it's something that everybody no matter where you're coming from, can have a part in playing um, and can have an impact in, you know, a variety of ways. And I think there's also this fear of compliancy, right? Like you're like, to the point, you can't give things out in Georgia anymore. Mm -hmm. well, I feel a lot of thoughts about that. Uh, but like, there is like that fear on the institutional level or faculty in their campus. I know there was like a question in the chat about like, what can faculty do? There is that fear of compliancy, right? Like, I don't want to be doing anything illegal. I don't want to be doing anything that like harms it. There are experts, you know, you can email me, you can email Lauren, you can email any of us, right? And just being like, I want to do this. What do you think? Do you think this is a good idea? This is a bad idea. And we're able to help you through it. There's also hotlines that are available for you. Uh, so there's just so many opportunities to like put yourself out there to help. I think like professors giving some time or leeway uh, to like have people go vote. I have contentious feelings about election day as a holiday on campuses because oftentimes people just leave campus and don't vote. But <laughs> um, I do think that there are a lot of things that folks can be doing um, on campus as an individual, as a professor, a student leader, or a president, you know, to actually be making those institutional practices a reality on campus. And so I think Compliancy is always an issue, but at the same time, there are people that are there to help you. There are lawyers everywhere who are more than willing to help you on this. And so there are opportunities for you to participate and don't worry, like we'll figure it out together. So just wanted to throw that out there because I've gotten more times than not on so many campuses that they're just like, well, I heard that this might not work, so then we're not gonna do it. And we're like, but actually in your state, you're okay. Like it's okay. <laughs> so, you know, folks, we'll figure it out. Yeah, I mean, I, I I love all of the things that like this this full conversation that we've had really kind of wrapping around. Um, we really hit. We've kind of taken a, a whole journey around a lot of different um, topics, things, ideas, nuggets. I know that um, yeah, I've been doing the work and for a, a long time, but I feel like I always walk away from these conversations about like why why wasn't I doing it that way? Or why wasn't I thinking about this work in this other specific way um, and things that I can think of about including um, in the way that we continue to do our work here. Um, so all of that to say, uh, we're gonna kind of wrap up um, here, but I, I do have one kind of follow closing question, I guess, for um, our panelists. I know that this work can be, um, taxing it can be all-encompassing it can be overwhelming it can feel um sometimes like it's a mountain that we can never get to the top of um and that it um in in the work we always say that there is no off election year it's like it's a it's a constant um <laughs> it's a constant thing there are always elections um and so i just want to I want to know like what keeps you motivated in the work or how do you practice self care so that you can you can stay in the work. Um, or any other pieces of advice that you might have for others um, as we close out the session. If anybody wants to I guess start. i'll just kick it off just by saying that like seeing my peers, you know, um, get involved is always really motivating I remember I had one friend who. I was always trying to get to register all the time and she just always had an excuse and it was just like I'm just really busy I think it, just the thought of just doing it just felt very overwhelming for her it was just like I just have a lot on my plate right now like I just cannot add that and I'm like well it's just like an easy form it's and if you have any questions about actually like going to Bodhi you can you know and it just took so long it wasn't until after she graduated that she actually like went out of her way to go to a rock the native vote table that I was at that she wasn't even at the event that it was at but she came just to get registered finally 
Um, and I was so happy that she did it. And then I remembered with the 2020 presidential election, that was the first one that she voted in. And of course, crazy, hectic, you know, um, election results. But she was texting me like, almost like hourly just being like just like trying to keep up because now she was invested because now she wasn't just watching the news but she was a voter who had cast a ballot and she was invested in seeing what was going to happen and it just I I loved getting all of her messages and I loved um just that shift of just you know just not just being very kind of you know pushing it away coming up with an excuse to being just like all in and just like it's the only thing that's on her mind that evening and just even you know in the days weeks following um you know staying updated and um and still reaching out you know if she has any questions about you know other elections still i still hear from her but um just being able to see that change for her or something that will definitely always like stand out and being like well you know there are dozens and countless, you know, people who have just gave me the, oh, not right now. Oh, not too busy. You know, I'm just too busy. But it's whenever you do finally kind of um, break through for whatever reason, whether that be just she was a senior and she was graduating and just a lot of life stress. That was one more thing that she just, you know, didn't want to add on on, on her plate at the moment. But, um, you know, just being able to kind of to kind of witness how how it can really be that 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 first dive into now just not being like, oh, well, I got someone registered to vote, but now they are a lifelong voter. And now they are paying attention, you know, and being really invested to what's going on. And not only that, but now they're sharing content, encouraging other people to get registered and, and to get involved. And they're sharing, you know, um, political information, you know, on, on their social media, trying to encourage other people to, you know, to, to get involved as well. Um, and, you know, so her specific story is definitely one that's really special to me, but um, definitely not um, not unique and not you know not not a standalone, just one that stands out for me. And then, um, oh gosh, I had a second point and then I forgot it because I was too busy talking about her. But <laughs> if it comes back to me, I'll, I'll let you know. But just definitely, uh, just you know, seeing seeing how people do have their that their habits and then their their lifelong investment can be impacted just by you know an outreach um and then you know one simple act it's definitely something that um that keeps me going and that keeps me really really encouraged i did re remember the second piece um it's not necessarily a self-care tactic but kind of definitely a note for um you know campus uh, you know uh, administration and you know nonprofits who are um, really relying on students as organizers to get, you know, to get this work done, because it is really important. Lauren was talking about it at the beginning about some of those grants, but, um, you know, this is definitely not anything that I do for money, um, but being able to compensate students who do the work because it is work and because it is taxing both, you know, physically, if you're, you know, in the hot sun running, you know, a, a registration booth for hours or carrying really heavy tables and pamphlets, but the emotional, you know, investment and labor and um, the knowledge that, that comes from it as well is something that's really valuable. And I definitely would encourage, you know, people who are in those higher positions, if at all possible, to compensate students um, who are doing this work. Um, because while we do it out of the goodness of our own heart, um, it is really important to make sure that, um, especially if you are trying to be inclusive and to get student um, workers who do come from different uh, marginalized backgrounds, not only racial ethnically, but but low income first generation um, small town students um, that, you know, this this is time, this is effort and this is work. Um, and so being able to provide some sort of um, compensation really helps um, get students, you know, invested in and, and, and feel valued in these um, organizing roles. And um, I definitely feel, have felt very valued at my time here at University of Oklahoma and with, and with Campus Vote Project and Rock the Native Vote, um, but definitely a, a, big, a big piece of advice and, and encouragement. I can go next. I think that there are two things. I think to everyone in this uh, like meeting and then anyone who listens in, like you are a voting expert, right? Like no matter what your knowledge set is, you are a voting expert. You will always be able to help yourself. And if you feel comfortable, you can always help a friend. I think uh, often you are the person 
who your friends and family know best. They trust you. You are a trusted messenger. You do not have to wait for the ACLU to provide guidance. You are a person who your people can like look to for guidance, support, and information. And I think to all the organizers in the chat, this is something that I've had to really deal with. Uh, Lauren heard about it a lot <laughs> during our one-on-ones, but the weight of democracy is not on your shoulders. You know, if you take a day off, the world is not going to end. Democracy will not fall at your feet. Uh, if you don't send out that email at 8.33 at night when you're supposed to get off at five, like it will be fine. <laughs> so uh, make sure you take care of yourself because if you don't take care of yourself, who will? And that's something that I'm trying to work on, you know? And so know that like you are part of a movement, you're part of a community, you're part of a legacy of hundreds of thousands of millions of people who are trying to make our democracy strong. And you are an important person, but you are not the only person. So you need to take care of yourself. You need to make sure that you are taking your time off, your PTO, or for, for folks who are full-time or for students, you know, school comes first and it is okay to sleep at a reasonable hour. Um, it is okay to put your studies first. It is okay to do all of those things. I think it's important to share, yeah. Democracy is not on your shoulders. The weight of the world is not on your shoulders. Take a break, breathe, <laughs> chill. For me, I pet my dog. So, you know, like I think and I hope and I strive that you all take care of yourselves in any ways that you can lean on folks to support each other and make sure you, make sure you build a community net to make sure all of the work is still getting done. We'll figure it out. So I, I will keep this brief, but I would just say that um, it's very easy to get caught up in the excitement and time pressure of a campaign. And, and, and just I would leave with the message um, that I also gave yesterday, and that is that so much of, of the, the thing that's going to have the biggest impact happens between elections. I mean, it is just um you know so awful to hear about wait times of six to seven hours i mean i had one person in front of me in my you know neighborhood uh, polling location and those type of disparities are just unacceptable in democracy and those are the type of things that that need to be focused on um you know in between elections when that time pressure that creates so much of the stress right um isn't um isn't there so thank you all so much for um having me to to talk about these important issues and for all of the, the, the advocacy work that, that you guys are all doing to put it in practice. Thank you so much. Um, and I guess one final thing that I'll lead with, and it's kind of in the same vein that, you know, it's not on all on you. Um, it's okay to say no. It's okay to know where your capacity lies. Um, I know that I want to say yes to everything because I think that I can help impact everything, but I think sometimes it's, it's knowing what you have the capacity to, to do and to take on, um, is really important, but then also thinking about, um, as we continue this work, make sure that you're training someone who knows all of the things that, you know, don't keep all of the knowledge just in your head, um, but make sure to share it. And because there is going to be a day that you need to sleep or you need to take a rest and somebody else needs to, to carry that work on. Um, and so those are, those are kind of my, my short little <laughs> um, add on nuggets for this. Um, but I'm gonna um, kick it back over to Dr. Crespin to, to close us out. So I just wanna thank all the panelists for, for being here and for this wonderful discussion. Thanks, Lauren um, and Catherine and Cameron um, for your work on this um, roundtable and, and especially all the work you do to promote civic engagement on campus and off campus and in communities. And I, I see now and, and uh, throughout the last couple of days, other people who do this kind of work. So thank you too. Um, and then finally, I want to thank um, our Rothbond speaker, uh, Professor Sunshine Hillegas, for um, her work into the, putting into this book. Um, the lectures she's recorded and the time she spent with us yesterday and today. We have a special award uh, that we're going to send to her. Here it is. Um, this is the official uh, Rothbaum Lecture Series um, uh, award that she gets. So we'll put that in the mail out to you. Um, so yeah, and thanks for my team and everyone else who helped support this program. And we look forward to doing this again in, in 2023. So thanks, everyone. Goodbye.